All right, welcome back to another edition of the Forts Athletics Life and Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Inferna, and I cannot believe that I am on the line with multiple-time world champion, world record holder, Jennifer Milliken. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us today. Yeah, sure. Glad to be here. So, Jen, like we were talking before, you know, why don't you just give us like a little background of, um, you know, how you got involved with sports as a kid, and we can go from there. Okay. Um, growing up, I always, I was always pretty athletic. I enjoyed playing sports. Um, primarily as a kid, I played softball and basketball. Um, it's probably a little better at softball. Um, you know, being five feet tall doesn't doesn't help too much in the basketball arena. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I played, played softball, basketball growing up. I always loved sports. And, um, once I graduated, once I graduated high school and that I was, wasn't able to play, you know, I wasn't playing any more sports on, on organized teams anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, in college I, I ran not like competitively, but I would like jog <laughs> and then, um, after I got married and we had children, my husband got into CrossFit, um, you know, sometime, sometime between child one and two. And, um, you know, when he was going to the gym and stuff like that, I thought maybe I would, I thought maybe I would give it a try after our, we had our son and, and I did. So we had, we had our son and then maybe, I don't know, eight months or so later, uh, started doing CrossFit and did that for about six months. And then somebody said that I should do that. I should try a powerlifting meet and did that and never looked back. So just like that, you just did your first powerlifting meet after, after having both kids. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's maybe what, like nine, 10 years ago that you first got into powerlifting. I want to say I've been, competing for about seven years okay seven years yeah so what um what did you know about powerlifting before you did your first meet like was it like that was there was there did something happen in the crossfit box that people were like oh jen you should you should try the bench or you should you're you squat a lot like how i mean because it just seems like an interesting transition from crossfit to powerlifting usually it's sometimes it's the other way around so was there like a glimmer of like wow she could be good at this stuff. Yeah, the the CrossFit gym that I that I was going to uh, did a little. It was very strength oriented, anyways. Mm -hmm. And it the gym there had a push pull. Okay. And it was just like just the people that were in the gym. You know, we just did it for fun. And so I did that and won. And and then somebody was like, "Well, here's you know." here's a full power meet, like a real one, right. if you want to do it. And so I signed up to do it and I knew absolutely nothing about powerlifting at all, except that it was squat, bench and deadlift. Mm -hmm. So what do you remember from that first, first meet? I mean, did, was there somebody like that kind of helped you along the way or did you and your husband just kind of show up and it know, was get a, weighed in and go? It was a few people from the gym, a couple, mm -hmm. me and a couple of other girls from the CrossFit gym. Mm -hmm. Um, went and did it. And as far as what I remember about it, I just remember being extremely nervous and like way more nervous than I anticipated mm -hmm. and underperforming, <laughs> or at least, you know, I thought I would, I thought I would have been able to hit better number. I mean, I still did really well. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, no, no question about that, right. but I just, you know, like, you know, how your expectations are. Mm -hmm. Like I thought my expectations were here and my sure. performance was here. <laughs> so what were you expecting out of, out of that first meet? Cause usually people like, like my first powerlifting meet, I didn't even, I was, um, I just graduated from college. I was 22 and I signed up for the American open in Philadelphia. And I had no idea what I was just like, Oh, powerlifting USA was a magazine back then in 2004. And uh, my brother was in college and I said, Hey, let's go to this meet in Philly. First meet ever. Like there's like a thousand people sitting in front of you trying and you're trying to squat. And it's like, Oh, 
I mean, that might not, that probably wasn't your first experience. Was it like a smaller gym and um, they there in Tennessee that you competed at or in Nashville where you're from? This was, yeah, this was actually in uh, North Carolina. Oh, okay. But um, yeah. And it wasn't the first, when I first started competing, I, I wasn't in USA powerlifting, you know? Okay. Um, but yeah, it was just, it's just nerve wracking. And I I think I want to say on my third squat, I was red lighted for depth. And then, um, and then my bang, I don't think I, I don't think I got any third attempts now that I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I don't, who knows? I don't remember. But my first USA powerlifting meet was in 2015. And that was definitely not what I expected at all. So the guy who writes my programming, Aaron Thomas, he was kind of bugging me. I had always competed in wraps, like raw with wraps. And he was kind of, kind of bugging me about doing a meet in sleeves in sleeves at USA powerlifting to, to get to world, you know, he wanted right. me to get to world. Right. And, um, you know, he was kind of bugging me about it. And I really, it liked at the time I really enjoyed competing in wraps and that whole right. thing. Um, and so I kind of, kind of just said, well, you know what, if, if a meet pops up near me right. for USA powerlifting, I'll do it. I just kind of made that deal with him. Right. And then one popped up in Atlanta and it was Georgia States. And so I, I have no idea what to expect at all. I just thought, well, this will be a small meet. It'll be no big deal. And, you know, there's over 300 lifters in the meet. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? This is not what I expected at all. Right. And then that meet was just me and my husband. My coach Wade was supposed to come, but something came up and he wasn't able to come. And so it, it was just me and my husband and we don't know what we're doing. We're used to these other meets where they're calling out lifters or they're mm-hmm. calling out like there's one, you know, all the other meets I had done, there's one platform. Right. And the announcers like announce like so-and-so is four out. So-and-so is three mm-hmm. out, you know, they do that whole thing. And so we're at this meet where there's 300 lifters, there's four platforms. Oh my gosh. There's nobody announcing like, you know, there's nobody letting you know where you are in the flight or anything. like, we don't know anything. And so I'm just, I'm just warming up. And I want to say my opener was like 335. I don't I, like, I don't know the kilos, but I think I did like, I hit 225 and warm and warm ups. And Michael comes up to me, my husband, he goes, Oh, Hey, you're four out. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, I guess we'll just go. Right. And so I just went and took a hundred pound jump from my, from my last warm up to my opening attempt mm-hmm. and it was fine. We ended, I mean, it ended up being, it all worked out in the end, but, and after that, that was pretty much it. Then I was all doing all USA powerlifting meets after mm-hmm. that. So when did you realize, and I don't want this to sound like, like a silly question or anything, but like, when did you realize you were good? Like, did, did like, was it after like your first like wrapped meets or was it after just that first one that you were like, Oh, wait a second. Like, this is like, I'm, I I could, I could have a career in this or I can go to worlds. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always knew I was strong growing up, Mm -hmm. you know, I just, I just always was. And then even like for softball in high school, we would have to lift in the off season. And I was, I was always like, stronger than all the like they would try to pair you up with people who they thought who you thought would lift about the same mm-hmm. and I could there was never a pair <laughs> <laughs> um so I, I've always known I was kind of strong I don't think I knew I mean I really think it was that that meet in Georgia I did that mm-hmm. meet in Georgia and I think that is when I kind of really started hitting a stride as far as kind of you know, not that it's not always fun, but it became like less about just having a good time and hanging out and more about like, man, I can be one of the best in the world and just getting really, really focused um, and kind of honing in on what I could do to reach the top. So when did you um, first hire a coach or have somebody start writing programming for you? Was that like in between your 
your first meet and when you started competing in ramps or was it not until your USAPL days? Um, trying to think whenever, when we moved back to Nashville, I, I'm trying to think of how many years ago that was. I want to say that was four, four or five years ago. Okay. Yeah. I guess 2014. Yeah. Um, moved back to Nashville and joined Wade's gym, mm -hmm. which was, you know, Wade's gym is powerlifting specific, uh, mostly. And, and so I joined his gym and he did the programming then. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like he, at, at the time, he didn't like write out a program for me and send it to me. I just showed mm -hmm. up and he was like, this is what we're doing today. Sure. Um, so I did that for the first little bit with Wade and then um, I started looking into RP, mm -hmm. Renaissance Periodization, mm -hmm. and because I was starting to look at, look into my diet and stuff like that. And me and Wade's son were both looking at the, the PDF and he's scroll, he's like looking at the pictures and there was a the guy in there. He was like, Hey, I know that guy. I went to high school with him and it was, Aaron Thomas, who now writes my programming. Wow. And so Wes was like, I'm going to shoot him a message and just see what's up. And so mm -hmm. he, he, he and Aaron talked and then Aaron reached out to me saying that he was interested in writing my nutrition. So he started out just writing my nutrition and, and about like, I don't know, four or five weeks after he started writing my nutrition, I kind of decided that I wanted my nutrition and my training to kind of coincide mm -hmm. and so Aaron started writing my programming then so did you ever like when you first started before you kind of like hit it hit it big did you like did you worry about like cutting weights for meats I mean because you've, you've competed you know it seems like before they changed the weight classes you know either one class or the other like did you ever was that ever in the back of your mind like oh my gosh like maybe I should try and go up a class go down a class stay where I'm at like is that um I've you know I've I've done all the things that they tell you not to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I've water cut for nearly for like 99.9% .9 of meats I've ever done. Um, I've gone. One of the things that Aaron and I did not long after we first started working together was cut to the 114 mm -hmm. weight class. And you know, that was a big, that was a big cut. That was kind of a turning point too, is when I did that cut, I kind of started to understand more like about diet and nutrition and, and how you can be successful at it. And then, and you know, what it takes to adhere to something that strict. So I've done it. I've literally done it all. I've gone down, I've gone up, I've stayed in the middle. <laughs> You prefer one over the other? I mean, 114 to, to where you compete now, that's kind of a bigger jump. Uh, yeah, uh, the 114 was, rather. yeah, 114 was a, was a one, one time and one time mm -hmm. only type mm -hmm. of deal. Um, Aaron has harassed me, and now it's kind of like an ongoing joke about if I'm ever going to go back to 114, and the answer mm -hmm. is a hard no. Um, but yeah, most, I've spent most of the, most of my career in the, uh, 57 kilo weight mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. and then just moved up a couple of years ago to the 63s mm -hmm. so so when so when you um like first first went to usapl uh, nationals right before you qualified for your first world, world championship did you have like an expectation of like i should go to like i've, I've had a, a good series of meets like i should like i should win like was there ever like talk a little bit about like the mindset going into the first time you competed at a national competition where, you know, people maybe knew who you were and um, you know, the cat's kind of out of the bag a little bit. Sure. The first nationals I did um, was actually after that Atlanta meet mm -hmm. uh, and, jo and Josh Rohr, who, who was running the Georgia state meet, he was also running nationals that year. Right. And so he came up to me that meet and I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who mm -hmm. anybody was, but he was like, you should do nationals. He's like, you would win. And I, you know, I kind of brushed it off at the time because I was like, uh, I don't even know. You know, I had no idea what he was even talking about. Right. And then I think it was sometime after that, that, uh, it was when worlds was in Colleen, mm -hmm. Texas mm -hmm. and 
me and Aaron were watching it and we saw Marissa Enda lifting and it was kind of then that I, I was watching that Worlds and Colleen and I was like, you know, I want to, I want to do that. I want to go to Worlds. Mm -hmm. I want to, I, I wanted to do it. And so it was after that, that we decided that we would, that we would go and do nationals mm -hmm. and not to sound and nobody really knew who I was like they saw my qualifying total mm -hmm. which was pretty good but even that qualifying total at that meet that I qualified at my my bench something weird happened mm -hmm. with my shoulder and my bench and I lost about 50 pounds on my bench so even that qualifying total was a little low but you know like when they were making the predictions and stuff they still weren't mm -hmm. predicting me to win right. but again not to sound like I'm full of myself, but I knew I was going to win mm -hmm. just because I knew they didn't know my bench had another 50 pounds on it. Right. So I knew, so the whole reason for going, I was like, I'm going to go to that. I mean, the plan was I'm going to go to nationals. I'm going to win. And then I'm going to go to worlds and I'm going to win. That was the plan. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a great plan, right? I mean, it definitely, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it, it worked out. I just, it, you know, like, just like the interesting thing about that is not, not just so much like, okay, I'm just going to do this. Like nobody knows that my, my bench is kind of, you know, off a little bit, but like talk a little bit about like, so like a lot of people can say, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this, but like you actually did it. Right. And, and like the cool thing is like, you have children, like you, you moved in this time, like you're just kind of like getting started in the sport and you're, you're, you know, you're going to win nationals. Like talk about like what else, like, did you have conversations with, with Aaron about, you know, visualization or kind of like how to approach like certain lifts? I mean, like I've, I'm, I'm nowhere close. Like I can't be on the same platform as you, but like you can only get fired up so many times b between like sets and like reps and stuff like that. So how did, did you have to like figure out like, you know, six months out, a year out, like, okay, this, we're going to take it easy or we're just going to go balls out and, you know, take over the world. Um. You know, I think one of the, as far as, as far as doing, like getting into that, into the zone or into the rhythm mm -hmm. of like knowing what you need to do to make stuff happen. I really think that cut to 114, it taught me so much about consistency and uh, being, you know, being committed to a goal. That was like a big turning point for me because when I was doing that cut, it there was always, there was always something. There's always a reason and, a, and oftentimes a pretty valid one to not follow, to not follow the plan, to not follow the diet, you know, whether it was a, you know, a holiday or I ran out of time and didn't, and, and wasn't able to, to get all my food prepped or something like that. You know what I mean? Like there was just, there was always a reason for me to not follow the plan. And one day I was just like, like it just kind of like clicked in my head. I just said to myself, I was like, I'm going to follow the plan no matter what. Mm -hmm. I was like, no matter what, I'm going to follow this plan exactly like it's written. And I'm just going to hammer it day in and day out. And I'm going to see what happens. And as soon as I started doing that, you know, it was like a, a juggernaut effect. Things just started happening. Like everything just started rolling. And um, so it was when I did that cut to 114 that I really learned the importance of like stacking these habits and like, mm -hmm remaining consistent and that just kind of put me in the in like a zone of like I don't know how to describe it but just like a bulldozer of I don't I just don't care I just don't care what's in my way I'm just going to keep going and it kind of led into that it's difficult I mean I'd be lying if, to tell you that I that I'm still in that place it's difficult to get back to it especially once you know it exists <laughs> You but yeah, as, yeah, yeah. As far as getting hyped up between lifts, I like, especially in training, I don't do a lot of that. I don't do a lot of hype. Um, or like, I kind of keep my energy in. Mm -hmm. I keep, I'm a, in a, like, I keep it in. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some people are more outwardly expressive and that works yeah. for them. But for me, it, like, it would take so much for me to like express myself that much outwardly that like right. I'd be, I'd be a, you know, a wet rag by the time I got right. under the bar. Right. Um, so I, I tend to keep it in. Um, and then it, visual visualization. I'm a big fan of, mm -hmm. 
um, when I was in high school, I, I did not perform under pressure at all. Like not even a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was, I would be my high school softball coach. I would be like up to bat with, you know, whatever, you know how it goes. Bases mm -hmm. loaded, two right. outs, right. you know, full count, whatever. And he would be like, he'd be like, all right, this is what you live for. This is the moment you live for right here. And I'm like, this is not at all the moment I live for. Right. I'm like, you got the wrong girl. <laughs> it's not me. That's right. not me. Um, but anyway, as I got older and once I got into powerlifting, that was one of my greatest things you know like when mm -hmm. I first started and I knew I was good I was like man I don't want to be good at something again and not be able to perform right and so I spent a lot of time figuring out way figuring out ways to overcome the mm -hmm. to overcome that feeling of mm -hmm. having too much pressure and not being able to execute mm -hmm. um, and I did that with a lot of um, a lot of visualization and a mm -hmm. lot of positive affirmations mm -hmm. to myself do you think like social media and like with how it's blown up and things? Cause I mean, you post, you know, like I was, you know, uh, showing my son cause he's like, Oh daddy, who are you going to talk to? And I was like, well, you know, she's a really good weightlifter. Oh, does she have a gym in her garage too? And I'm like, well, she kind of has a gym in her house now, but yeah. uh, he's like, daddy, her plates are different colors than the ones you lift with. But like, <laughs> so like how, like, how do you like get over that? Like where, you know, you put together a really great cycle and you know, you're going to show up at a meet. And even if you're at 90%, you should still win. Like, does it even, does it still like kind of creep in the back of your mind of like, Hmm, like, did I do everything I could? Or is it because you've been lifting for a long time, you know, you, you're like experienced, like you can show up and you don't, you know, maybe you don't have to worry about that as much as, you know, somebody who's, I don't know, like 10 or 15 years younger than you are. Um, you know, like, it's kind of a double edged sword, because I know, like, I know on the one hand, you know, and I preach this a lot is that that the details do matter is that the small things, all the small things you do lead up to the one big to the one big result. But then, but then on the other hand, I'm also like, you know, just, just do what you can and try not to get too overly stressed about about the small things you know like i think that's the thing with some of these young lifters they get they worry about the wrong things mm -hmm. like you know like if they have the right bar or the right bench or the exact right equipment or stuff like that right. you know it's at the end of the day you just have to to work with what you have and the same goes for like performing at meets i mean right. Some days you go and it's just not there, you know, Wade and I, when we go into meets, we always have an A, B and a C option mm -hmm. as far as attempts go, you know, A option is, is the ideal about what we expect mm -hmm. attempt. And then we have a, this day is not the day, this day is not ideal attempt. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, holy shit, I'm on fire day attempt so you know you kind of got to go in with with an open mind and just take what the day gives you and so not you, get oh. not get too hung up on specific mm -hmm. numbers so do you think social media that's what i was trying to get at because i'm sorry i was trying i get lost some every once in a while like <laughs> with social media do you think that um like that's a detriment sometimes like with i mean power lift, you know people post videos all the time and and then it kind of gives a a certain aura of like expectation of, well, I can do this in my garage. There aren't, there aren't judges around, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, but then what do you think it makes the difference for, for athletes? Yeah, I don't know. Like somebody bet squats 500 pounds in their garage and then they're going to go, you know, open with that at a meet. Like what, like what, what do you possess that allows you to do it? But then somebody else might not be able to, besides like, cause you just mentioned, you know, worrying about the wrong bar or the bench or the rack height and stuff like that. Like, cause there, I mean, I think there's more to powerlifting than just, you're just going to go out and bench. Cause it's not always the strongest person that day that's going to win. Like you said, you have your, you know, you, you plan your things out, but like, when did, when did you realize that that was really important that it's okay to have, you know, I'm not going to open at 200 kilos today. I'm going to open at 185 or whatever it is. Like how long did it take you to kind of figure that out? A long time. <laughs> I want to say I was like <laughs> 10 meets in 
sure. at the time I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get hung up on a specific number. Mm -hmm. I used to be really bad about that. You know, mm -hmm. like just wanting to hit one very specific number and just like forcing it before it was there. Right. Um, you know, that took me a really long time, but when I finally did that, you know, I found that I was much more satisfied with my performances. You know, I felt, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people will post not the day I, not the day I was planning, but right. blah, blah, blah. Here are my numbers. Right. And I'm like, stop planning so much. Like, right. like, like I said, try to have a range, try to have a range. And I think mm -hmm. that your satisfaction regarding your mm -hmm. meet day performance will be a lot better. Mm -hmm. And then if you're satisfied with your meet day performance, you're going to likely be satisfied with more satisfied with your entire training cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that definitely took me a really long time to, <laughs> to learn. And then as far as social media goes, you know, that's another thing I used to get caught up, like get super worried, get super stressed out about. I would see other lifters and they would be either lifting a lot more than me or, you know, they could do a lot more volume than me, you know, whatever it is, but they're not me. Right. And, and, you know, they're not me and I'm not them. Like the training is going to look differently. Like some people can train, have such a higher capacity for volume and they can do, you know, they can like rep out like 97% of their max, but that I can't, you know, and I just have to kind of have to tell myself, Jennifer, you're good at doing one single attempt. That's right. all, you know, you just right. have to take it one at a time and try not to compare yourself to the internet. I mean, right. it's the worst. My, um, Michael used to say to me, comparison, com you know, it's cliche, but com comparison is the thief of joy. And it really is. If you're constantly comparing yourself to another person, you take you, the, the joy in your own accomplishments and your own progress is robbed. So, so talk a little bit about that, that first meet when you're going to set the world on fire and, and you go to your first nationals, what, like leading up to that, leading up to that meet, what, what were your expectations? Cause was that like the, the biggest, um, as far as, um, I don't know, like, uh, importance of meet that you've competed at was that first, um, nationals. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, and it was the thing where I, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't mm -hmm. have very much expectations, mm -hmm. but then it also, you know, it also happened to be the first time they ever did prime time. Mm -hmm. And um, like I said, Josh, Joshua was running the meet. And so they were putting a, you know, putting a lot of effort into the hype and stuff like that. And I think it, I want to say that was the first year they switched it to where it had to be all like IPF approved equipment. Mm -hmm. And there was a few of us all training for it at the gym together. Mm -hmm. And so it was just kind of like in the gym, we were all, we're all training. It was all getting hyped up and then right. like all the stuff with the equipment, you know, like tensions were kind of high, but um, yeah. So it was definitely the most important meet that I had done. And you know, I think I did, I think I did okay. I, my, again, my expectations were a little bit higher than they should have been, but I still, I mean, I still had a really great meet. So, and that was, you know, and I was still extremely nervous. Like my opening squat attempt was atrocious, but you know, we made it through. <laughs> we did what we set out to do, which was win and get to go to Worlds. So when you, so after you take that last deadlift and you realize that you won and that you're going to go to Worlds, like what goes through your mind? Because, you, I mean, it seems like up until that point, you've only been powerlifting for what, like maybe three years, like four years. And now all of a sudden you're a U.S. champion, uh, you know, starting to smoke these records and you're going to the world championships. Like what, like what goes through your mind when, you know, they, they say Jennifer Milliken, you won and you're going. Yeah. I mean, I was so hyper-focused on worlds mm -hmm. that it was just like, after nationals, I was like, okay, next check. Let's go. Let's start training for worlds now. Mm -hmm. And at that point, and I didn't even know what the Arnold was, <laughs> you mm 
you know, I didn't know right. anything about the Arnold. It's in my mind, I was like, okay, we did nationals. Now we get to train for worlds. And I was so yeah. hyper-focused on worlds. Mm -hmm. And then I got invited to the Arnold and I was like, what is this? Why do I have to do this now? You know, but it's kind of funny. But yeah, I was just, like I said, I was so in the zone about, about going to worlds that as soon as the nationals was over, I just checked it off my list and mm -hmm. was like, okay, let's move on. So when you, so the, the time between nationals and worlds, like, is there, do you change much? Or is it just, okay, we should make sure we have our passport. Like, we got to make sure someone's going to watch the kids. My husband's going to come with me. Like, because I think some, most people maybe might take it for granted. Like, they see what people post on social media. And there's, like, this all this other stuff, right? Like, so I have kids. You know, you have kids also. So you can't just, like, pick up and leave for, like, a week or two weeks, you know, go halfway around the world. So, like, what what other, like, details did you do you have to make sure before – you know, making, making that trip? Like, did you change anything with programming or, you know, nutrition was on point. So you might, you probably didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. For worlds, you know, it was just more of like more of the same as far as training and nutrition goes. Right. Um, and then we did kind of that first worlds, we did kind of strategize towards the deadlift. Mm -hmm just because I knew the competition and I knew I could, I could stay, stay right with them in the squat and the bench. And, and I knew I could out pull them. Right. So we kind of focused on the deadlift a little bit for that first mm -hmm. worlds, but mm -hmm. that's really the only change. I mean, as far as actually getting to worlds, all the administrative stuff, you know, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the first year I went, I wasn't sponsored or anything like that. And so I had to, you know, I had to, to go on my own dime, which, you know, I know a lot of people still are still have to do that. Um, right. But the first year, you know, I kind of had to do, had to do all of that on my own. And I had mm -hmm. my mom and dad came and Wade came. Mm -hmm. And then of course my husband and it was in Minsk, Belarus. And there was all mm -hmm. this, stuff with visas and right. passports yeah. and sending off papers and like we had to put our birth certificate and like our passport in the mail to send it to the visa office and then they send it back to us i was like i feel uncomfortable right <laughs> putting these important documents in the hands of the united states postal service right. like, um <laughs> but yeah that was you know it was kind of crazy mm -hmm. just getting there and then you know, a long, a longer story for another time is on the way to Belarus, my husband lost his passport oh my gosh. between Nashville and Chicago. He lost okay. his passport. And so I had to leave him in the airport, mm -hmm. like in the Chicago airport. I was like, okay, bye. Like, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly, it was not like that at all, but right. you know, so it was, it was just kind of, crazy the traveling mm -hmm. part of it is a little can get a little weird mm -hmm. as far as the timing of when you get there mm -hmm. um there can be travel issues you know like mm -hmm. losing a passport or mm -hmm. losing luggage or right. delays anything like that um mm -hmm. visa requirements mm -hmm. um all that all that sort of stuff kind of comes up how many days um, out before the, the meet did you get there? Like, did you have, like, you know, I want to get there a week out, get acclimated to the time difference, or did you? Um, Susie, Susie was the head coach my first, mm -hmm. well, she was my head coach both years, mm -hmm. but she recommends to get there at least 48 hours out. So mm -hmm. I want to say the first year I got there, like three days before I was supposed to compete mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's really helpful. I think mm -hmm. for me particularly, like I don't travel well, mm -hmm. like I do, I don't, I don't like planes, trains or automobiles. Mm -hmm. Like I just don't feel good. Sure. Um, so I definitely wanted to get there early enough so I could like kind of mm -hmm. settle, settle in. Mm -hmm. So what, so when you got there, you're, cause you, we've talked about expectations versus reality. So when you're in a warm up room, right. Getting ready to, to go out on a stage, like, what like did you did you know like this is 
like I, I'm going to outpull everybody. Like it's not even a competition or were you like more focused on, okay, we'll just do one lift at a time, see what happens. And then we'll get to the deadlift. We'll figure it out from there. Cause you talked about like the A to B and the C. So when you were there, was it all a, we're going all out or was there a little bit of strategy of, you know, as long as I stay within 10 to 15 kilos, that should be okay when it comes to deadlifts. Um, the, the first worlds, it was, we were, we were right on the money. I mean, everything was great. When I was warming up for squats, I, you know, I hit, I want to say I hit like 140 or something. And I was like, it's going to be a good day. You know, like I knew warming up for, for that particular world that it was going to be a good day. And all of our attempts were just exactly like we planned them out. And then um, my competitors missed Maria T who, who is my main competition. Mm -hmm. And then Ina Filonova, they both kind of weren't, they weren't having a, a great day, you mm -hmm. know, T missed her second attempt squat, I think. Mm -hmm. And once, you know, once she missed, it was like after that, it was going to be, if anybody missed at that point, it, it was going to be difficult for them to come back. Right. For them to still be mm -hmm. in it. So, and I was trying to not pay attention at all what was going mm -hmm. on and just lift, just do my job. And that's kind of how I try to keep it like, I don't pay attention to what's going on at all during the meet, like with other lifters or things like that. I really just try to do exactly just do what Wade tells me to do. He, he'll literally be like, okay, take your warm up now. Like, okay, on your feet, stand up. All right. Take a drink of water. Like <laughs> I literally just do whatever it is he says. And as far as numbers go, I don't have any, we don't discuss it. I just let him make the call and I just try to do my job. That's what Wade, Wade says. Uh, I think you lift. So I just try to lift. <laughs> so what, so after you came home from that meet, like what, um, like did anything change? Like any, like as far as like training or are you just, okay, we're gonna, we gotta qualify for the next one. Like how, like how does, I don't know. I mean, I've never been there. So as far as like, you know, the, the, these awesome experiences, like what happens when you get back to the U S you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like anything, you know, like Christmas morning when it's over, you're like mm -hmm. a kind of sad a little bit. You're right. like, well, now what? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always like the first, you know, that first, that first big win, the first, the first time going to worlds like that, right. that can never come back that feeling. Um, right. um, and it is difficult to like jump back in with the same kind of drive. Cause mm -hmm. you know, cause you did it, you checked it off. Right. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, that's, it's boring, but we just get right back to regular mm -hmm. training. You know, I'll mm -hmm. take like a week off or something like sure. that, but typically the further I am out from a meet, you know, I'll be doing, I'll be doing more reps, mm -hmm. um, more reps. So it'll be, you know, lighter, lighter loads, not specific, not competition specific exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, I know I'll squat low bar and competition, mm -hmm. but if I'm, if I'm far out from a competition, it's always high bar, um, uh -huh. you know, just not competition specific to sure. specific stuff like mm -hmm. close grip bench or incline overhead mm -hmm. press. Sometimes we switch up. I normally pull conventional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll pull sumo for a little bit, um, you know. And then just as you get closer to the meets, the reps drop, right. weights go up, and then we just get more competition specific. It's not. It's pretty boring. <laughs> so like, so do, do your kids like? Do they realize like mom's like a world champion? Like, is it like anybody in the community is like, oh my gosh, like we got a badass living next door to us, or is it? Like how, what's that, like, what's that kind of feel like, or do they, uh, do they even realize that your kids? Like, yeah. I mean, they, they do, they don't care, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, yeah, but are you going to make me breakfast or yeah, what's right. going on? <laughs> um, yeah, the kids know. And, you know, I think they think it's pretty cool. Most of the time, most of the time sure. they don't care. Um, right. and some people, some people know in the community, like at their school and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't, it gets brought up every now and then, but 
<laughs> not a whole lot. And I sure. try to, I try to downplay it a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> so what, um, so, you know, the, like the cliche, the expression, you know, the wolf climbing the mountain is hungrier than the one on top. So, so when you went back the following year, like, were you like, is it, was it difficult to stay a hundred, hundred percent focused, like motivated every single day? Cause I mean, you had to compete, right. You had to qualify for nationals again. You had to win nationals. Like, is it, are you as hungry or is it like, nah, it's just, I just got to show up when, and you know, we'll figure out worlds when we get there. Um, yeah, no doubt. The second, yeah. the second year I, I, I went to nationals. Um, I definitely wasn't, I didn't have the same drive. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that too is I already knew what to expect. Mm-hmm. And, um, the class wasn't, that competitive you know at the time it's right. since gotten it's since gotten a lot more competitive but at the time there wasn't anybody exactly nipping at my heels mm-hmm. and so and i really like that part of it you know mm-hmm. i kind of like the idea that i need to prove somebody wrong mm-hmm. um and that's that's a lot of the reason why i moved up to the 63s is because the class is so competitive you know i wanted to be a part of it and mm-hmm. I definitely need that sort of drive for sure. So what's, uh, I mean, this whole, like this Corona stuff is like sweeping, you know, everyone's like changing things up. You're training a little differently now. So what's like, what are like next steps for you? Like moving forward, like up here in, like I live in New York, so everything has been shut down for, for a month and it, there's no, no end in sight. So, um, mm-hmm. uh, powerlifting meets up here. Everything's pretty much canceled like through August. So now we're already looking into September. So for, for you who, you know, if you were going to compete this summer or, um, you know, kind of ramp up again, cause I, cause nationals are in, usually in the fall, right? Is it like an October, November type thing? Yeah. <clears throat> so what, so what do you like, what does Jen Milliken do now? I mean, obviously you're still training, but I mean, like, does the focus change or do you kind of take the pedal off a little bit, kind of recharge the batteries? Um, well, I'm supposed to go to worlds this summer and mm-hmm. it, you know, that's been rescheduled. It was originally scheduled in June and now it's scheduled the end of September. Right. First week of August or mm-hmm. first week of October. Mm-hmm. So the focus right now is still worlds where we obviously have a little bit more time. So we'll probably just go back to the, go back to high volume, Mm -hmm. all all the reps, (laughs) all the things. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm set up pretty good in here. I've got a power rack and a barbell. So I'll I'll be fine as far Mm -hmm. as training goes. Um, It is a little bit, you know, it is a little bit more difficult to like get like actually get in that little tiny room I have and train. Mm -hmm. It's not as fun. I've always Mm -hmm. trained with a group. I've always, we've always trained together at Wade's. And so Mm -hmm. that part is kind of depressing, but I'm trying to just keep it, you know, trying to keep it in the forefront of my mind that this is a time when a lot of people, when it would be easy to just drop off and be like, Mm -hmm. uh, who cares? Like right. it would, it would definitely be easy to lose focus and not care. And, and, and that would be understandable. So I'm trying to keep it in the forefront of my mind that, you know, this can also be a good opportunity to really get really strong. I mean, right. you know, I'm at home. There's no reason that I can't be, that my nutrition can't be on point, you know, I can, can get out and do cardio. I can do all the training on my own time. I don't have to wake up super early. I don't have to drive my kids to 800 different activities right. um, and get everybody, you know, I don't have to do anything. I, all I literally have to do is train <laughs> and work. I mean, I'm still working, but I can, I'm working from home. Right. So I'm trying to just <laughs> keep it going. It's difficult though. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say, you make it sound so easy. All I have to do is like, you know, go into this room and train like what, like as far as like time management, like you have to like how, like how do you figure that stuff out? And I guess that's really what's so intriguing to me is that 
um, you kind of came to powerlifting, maybe a little, you know, you haven't been powerlifting since like your early, you know, early twenties or anything like that. So you're still relatively young, you know, um, you know, age wise and you, you balance all this stuff. So for, for the people who, you know, maybe don't have kids or, you know, whatever, like what, what advice do you have for them as far as like how to, how to be able to continue training, you know, keep your nutrition on point through this like kind of crazy time that we have right now? Um, I'm a, what I'm currently trying to do for myself is, um, kind of write out a daily schedule and adhere to Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. just because, you know, it's easy to just be sitting around not doing anything. And then suddenly it's five 30 and you're like, what have I done with my life? Um, (laughs) so I've been, I've been trying to like have a daily schedule that I follow for the most part. Mm -hmm you know, and I really like, I really like structure and doing the same thing every day and like Mm -hmm. following a plan. I really thrive, thrive in that environment. So that is my, I mean, even in and out, in or out of quarantine, I think that's good for anybody, Mm -hmm. especially like you said, the younger lifters who don't necessarily have to have such a structured life, you know, Mm -hmm. like as a parent, you know, that if you're like, 30 minutes behind in the morning, like the whole rest of the day is off. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. horrible. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. We know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I would, I would recommend to those that don't necessarily have those mandated structures <laughs> <laughs> to maybe, to maybe put one in place, like decide, you know, decide you're going to train at the same time every day. Um, Cause I know some people are kind of willy nilly just train. And that's kind of what I have fallen into here is like, oh, I'll just, I'll get to training when I get to it mm-hmm. or whatever. But I've kind of been like, all right, I need to have a plan here. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. Well, at least your kids are a little older. They're a little more self-sufficient. I, my oldest is six. So we, we have a, a daily schedule. So my, you know, like I mentioned before, so my wife and I were both educators. So, nine to nine thirty is this nine thirty to 10 is this 10 to 11 we play and then we get ready for lunch and the kids know that all oh, that 10 to 11 time either daddy's going in the garage and we're going to lift with them then or we're going to lift with them at three uh it's like three thirty to four thirty before we start like prepping dinner and before this like quarantine stuff it was maybe like train like two or three nights a week like after they go down so like eight or nine o'clock now it's like every single day and I'm not, like when I was 22, yeah, sure. We could go, you know, go, go lift every single day. It's not a big deal. You don't have to worry yeah. about anything. But then you have like, you know, five-year-old jumping on you or they walk by you. I mean, at least your room is small enough where no one's going to like go, you know, cross your line. Yeah, they can't. They, they can't. can't. they can't. They would get yeah. hit by a barbell. <laughs> yeah, right. Or mine, we have the garage. So like I have, you know, the two-year-old's on a box over here. The five-year-old's trying to pick up the 26-pound kettlebell. The other one has dumbbells. I'm like, oh my gosh, guys, like just give me like two yeah. seconds. But uh, no, it's really interesting. This whole like work-life balance stuff. I don't know. It's so cool how other people kind of figure it out. But um well, Jen, I, you know, I appreciate your time. I don't want to keep you, you know, too long or anything like that, but I appreciate you taking the time to uh, um, come on and share some thoughts about, you know, work life and powerlifting. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out and having me on. Thank you so much, Jen. Take care. All right, you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.